Okay, um, I need to finish up with, uh, don't worry, I'm going to talk about the um, exam. Uh, but first, I need to talk about one more data type, which is the deck. And that's this one here, which is a double-ended cube. That's what it stands for. Um, as like a cube, there's a head and a tail. But the thing is that you can add, in, in a cube, you can only add things at the tail. And you have to remove them at the head of the queue, right? With a deck, you can add and remove from both ends of the um, data structure. And the thing is, this is the weird part about a deck. So I can either add to the tail, remove from it, add to the head, or remove from the head. Now, with a stack, there's an analog view that we're familiar with, like a stack of books. We understand how stacks of things work. And with a queue, we have a natural understanding of how a queue works because we stand in line for things all the time. This is a weird data structure, and a lot of people don't understand, well, you know, what would this look like in the real world? And the only real world analogy I can come up with is a railroad switching yard. So if you have a train here and you need to take a locomotive that's, the, that's going in this direction, it's going up towards the top of the page, and you need to reverse it, well, that's really hard to do unless you have a double-ended queue. You can take the locomotive off to siding at this end, and then you can bring in a new locomotive at the other end, and then you're off in the other direction. And if similarly, it lets you take off cars at one side and add them at another side. And, of course, trains aren't a big thing here in the United States, so a lot of people aren't familiar with it. But a deck is exactly the data structure that we would need if we were running a switching yard. Okay, and that's the best example I can give. If anybody comes up with a better example, please let me know. And then, um, well, actually, I should probably go through this in the order that the book does. So here are the operations. You can create a new one. Now it's just sort of add and remove. We have to tell where we want to add and remove, namely at the head or tail, and remove at the head or tail. And also when you want to peek at something without removing it, now you have to be able to do it at both sides of the queue. A deck, excuse me. The nice thing about a queue is that it's always clear where things are going to be added and where things are going to be removed. With a deck, you are in charge of keeping track of it. So you have to make sure that you're adding things at the right point and removing them at the right point. And then is empty in size, same as everything else that we've been doing. And let me just go here for the implementation because it's a little bit easier to read. Yeah. And it's going to look a lot like Q, by the way. Um, when we add to the head, we add it at the end of the array list, when at the tail is at the beginning, and therefore we have to add at position zero. Uh, I guess I should put something in here. Am I going to be uploading this? I might be, yeah. So this is. And when we add to the tail, this is going to be order n because we have to push everything aside. Uh, when we remove things from the head, head that's going to be linear and a constant excuse me constant time and when we remove item zero everything else has to move down so this is going to be linear order n um this is order one and just looking at it without removing it is also constant time uh, the size is part of our data structure, so this is also order one. And um, the two string is going to be order n. I haven't done this analysis before with all the other data structures, but if you want to go through and look at the them and add that on, that would be great. And then the example they give in the book for how to use one of these. I'm not thrilled with this example, but it's it's a reasonable one. So we want to see if a given string is a palindrome, which is the same forwards as backwards. And what we'll do is we'll push all the characters into a deck, and then we'll remove from... Probably better if I go through this. So let's say I have a word like... 
So this is going to be at the tail of the deck, and this is gonna be at the head of the deck. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to remove one from the tail and remove from the head, which now leaves A, D, and A in the middle, in the deck. And I check to see if they're the same. If they're the same, then I keep on going. This is now my deck, and I'm going to remove the A. Oops. which leaves a D here and an A here. So this is gonna be. And those match, and now I have only one letter left and that means it's a palindrome. Does this make sense, the, the, the logic of this? Um, and if I were to have something like, let's say, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good, uh, I'm trying to think of a non-palindrome with, um, so again, if this is here, that leaves me with U, L, and E in the deck, and the head is an R, and that matches with step one. And then I pull off the next one, which gives me the U versus an E. And that doesn't match, which is step two. And therefore, it's not a palindrome. And the code is here. So we're going to add all the letters at the tail of that of the deck. And then as long as this deck of characters is more than one, if it gets down to zero, that means also that it was an even number of items. Then we grab the first character and the last character. And if they are not equal, we can stop right away. We don't have to go any further. The moment we have a mismatch, we know the answer. If we get through this entire loop with only one or zero characters left in the deck, then we can return true, which means we have a palindrome. And so regular is not a palindrome, rotator is indeed. I, you have, whenever you write one of these um, palindrome methods, by the way, you want to test it with both an even number of letters and an odd number of letters to make sure it works for both cases. So that's a deck. One of the less exciting data structures. Honestly, I don't come. You don't come across them very often. But there it is. If you if you ever need it, there it is. Okay, on on to uh, better business here, or more, well, theoretically more important business, which is reviewing for the test. Okay, so here are topics that you will want to know about. And by the way, did you all see the announcement on this? Okay, um, I want to do this explicitly. I'm going to record this as well since I'm recording it. One thing that you might want to do to make sure that you see the announcements is go to account, notifications, and then um, under announcements, you can be notified immediately via email and you can have more than one email address and you can have push notification for your devices. So you can turn them off or on. But I strongly suggest for announcements, you really want those on. If you don't have it on already, because I've seen people who have um, not have missed that. So, okay. So anybody can give me an, an example of procedural abstraction or what it even is. This is where we have a method that we call, and this is not a formal definition, by the way. We call by name, and we don't know what it's doing internally. It's sort of like the math.square root method, or let's take a, um, 
let's say array list dot index of method. Do you know how it's actually doing its thing? No. You just call it and it's an abstraction. You just say, whenever I call this method or a procedure, I'm going to get what I want. Um, definitely know what these terms are and those are all in chapter one. I'll let you look them up on your own. Oh, that reminds me. This is a big question that everybody's been asking. Okay. This will be an open note exam and um, I'm going to make it open book. The way I'm doing it is, can I show you this without um, blowing away everything on this? I think I can. I've got to be real careful about what I show you here. Uh, that's because I don't want to show you all the questions quite yet. So it's going to use the lockdown browser. And by the way, you should have done the um, other test, the, te the test exam, so you can check to see that Respondus works. And, um, well, that's interesting. I did not put it in. Oh, that's right. It's in question number one. Okay. Let's go back to quizzes. I'll put it in here as well. Somebody tested this for me, by the way. And uh, thank you to who, to the person who did that. There's going to be a link in the instructions and also a link in the first question. And that will let you get to the book. Okay. So it'll open up in a new tab. But the Respondus browser normally does not let you do that sort of thing. So, so it's open book, open note. Um, not I've seen this happen, believe it or not. Um, I would honestly prefer that you be here in the classroom to do this, even the, and it will only be open by the way between 9 15 and I think 11 30. I think that's when I opened it up, and that means that. You're going to have to do it during that time frame. Being here also is better because if you have a question about what a question means, you can ask me. I'll be right here and I'll be able to tell you. That's one thing. So if you don't understand a question, ask me. If I can give an answer without giving away the whole real answer, I will. Okay. Sometimes people ask me a question, I, I, if, if answering it would tell them the correct answer. But if they say, well, you know, did you really mean that you want this to be a stack or did you want this to be a queue? Okay, that's perfectly reasonable. I'll be glad to answer that. Hey, um, why do we have primitive data types anyway? There's going to be a question. How, how did I make this list of topics? I went through the test and every question on the test, <laughs> I wrote of something like this. So that's how we know that what this is going to be is going to be on the test. Um, well, first thing, if we didn't have them, we'd only have a bunch of binary data. <laughs> so that lets us put an interpretation on binary data. Remember when I had that... Uh, um, slide a few weeks ago where I showed a bunch of bits and interpreting it as an integer or a float or a string. Okay, so primitive data types let us put some face on the um, on what would be an ordinary to anonymous binary data. And also, as the book says, the primitives, I can't type today, <laughs> are a building block for other algorithms. Why do we want to encapsulate the details of the information? Well, first of all, you have to ask, what is encapsulation? Okay, you have to know that. And I'll let you, that's in the book, by the way. One thing that you can do when you're in the book and you need to look something up is here. And I can say encapsulation. Oh, well, Tra-la, there it is right there, okay? Man, I made this way too easy. I guess I should have done closed book, but eh, oh well. Yeah. Sure, 
I'm in the book, I click this here. And then if I need to see something, for example, like data type. Yeah. And abstract data types, yeah. or if I need to look up something like primitive. Yeah. Paragraph with a defined term. Oh, there we go. Lovely. That just tells what they are. Okay. It doesn't tell why they're good. So you may, but I strongly suggest that you knowing that you have the list of topics, you go back through the book and look them up and make some notes. Because remember, it's open notes. Um Why do we want to separate the user interface of a data structure from the implementation details? That's a very good question. So again, I'm not going to give you the answers to all of these now, but you can look this up. This is These are things that you can go and look up in the book and write yourself some notes, which is like what I did here, because there's a couple of them that I need to refer to later. Um, another definition of an array list, a hash map, and a set. Okay, so I'm going to give you this array list um, is essentially a linear structure. It's like an array, but it can grow or shrink, which arrays cannot do without an extreme amount of angst. Um, question, are array lists ordered or are they unordered? Yeah. They're ordered. What about a hash map? Anybody can tell me what what's 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 a hash map let you do? Hmm? It has a keys, right? And what what does it have besides keys? Right. It has key value associations. Is that ordered or unordered? It's unordered. There's no particular order to a hash map. Put things into them, and when you print it out, you may not get them in the same order that you put them in. Um, dictionaries in Python, I think they've updated it so you will always get the, the order that you put them in, but there's no guarantee in other languages. I know in Perl, there's absolutely no guarantee of it. And Java, I don't think it's guaranteed either. And what about a set? What's the difference between a set, a hash map, and an array? Array list. Question, with an array list, I could have something like 3, 5, um, 22, 7, 5, 4. Could I have a set with those elements in it or not? Would that be a valid set or would it not be a valid set? The, go back to your math and algebra definition of a set. What do we know about sets? Pardon? So it contains no duplicates. So is this a valid set? No, it is not. So set because all values must be unique. They can appear only once. Um, is it ordered or unordered? Is there a particular, with an, again, with an array list, we know we have item number zero, item number one, item number two, item number three. What about a set? Is that ordered or unordered? That is correct. It is also an unordered uh, data structure. Okay. Classes can inherit from only one superclass. That, that, I'm not going to ask you that. That's That's just a fact of Java. We do not have multiple inheritance which causes its own interesting array of problems. Um, but a class can implement as many interfaces as it wants to. So just know, know that that is the case. Actually, that might be part of the question now that I think about it. Um, what's polymorphism anyway? That comes from, by the way, the back matter in the book. It's in the chapter on... Um, object-oriented stuff. I think it's Appendix A. Anybody remember what polymorphism is? It's 
So we can assign a child class object to a what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do you need me to give an example of that or not? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's say I have here, um, wow. <laughs> All of a sudden I blanked out here on what's a good example here. Um, uh, I hate shapes, but okay, fine. Okay. So if we have a last shape here. Um, and then we have a class circle. How do you say that it's a subclass? Extend shape. And we have class rectangle also, which extends shape. I can do this. I can sh call shape S is going to be a new circle. That's okay. That will work fine. I'm assigning a child class object to a super class variable. If I say rectangle R is new shape, that's not okay because I'm doing the wrong way because all circles are shapes, but not all shapes are rectangles. Um, by the way, how would I make sure that nobody could ever, it, clearly, I mean, I can build a circle, I can build a rectangle, the, the, those are things that I know, but it, really, there's no such thing as a shape, that's sort of an, an amorphous concept, right? How do I make sure that nobody ever says something like this, shape S2 is new shape? Yeah? Yep. Now nobody can create a shape object. They have to implement a concrete class. So. In fact, as long as I've got this here, I may as well. Man, I got way too many blank lines in here. It's not a temp point. Oh, that's because they're all paragraphs. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry about that right now, okay? Does it do you care if there's extra lines in here? Does it bother you? It bothers me a little bit, but they not not enough to fix it right this second, okay. Um Meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, we need to know how to write a method that takes a generic parameter and returns a generic type. And that would be something like, um, let's say public static. You have to give the name of the type and then it can return that type. or it could return anything it wants to. But that lets you create a generic parameter um, just for that one method instead of having to make your whole class generic. Um, where is that in the book, you might ask? That would be here in generics. where I have this saying, I'm going to have a search method that takes some generic type of array and a generic target, and it returns an integer, but I have to define T somewhere and I can define it on the fly. That's what this is doing. That's what this, this first T in the angle brackets does. Um, how do you make a child a class? A, 
a class, a child of another class? Well, we already answered that, right? You really want to know the difference between composition and inheritance. So let's put a composition is a whereas inheritance is a and there's a verb that goes in there. I'll let you figure that. I'll, I'll let you. I, I need to give you something to study on your own here. Um, we know that an abstract class can't be instantiated, but it can have non-abstract methods in it. Um, what's a benchmark anyway? And that's one that we may not have talked a lot about, but that's essentially when we're going to be analyzing how long it takes a program to do a task. Now, that's not a good method of figuring out if something's efficient. Again, this is in the book. And the reason it's not a tremendous way of doing it is a benchmark is dependent on um, the computer you use, the compiler, and the programming language. Okay. So something that works really, really fast in, let's say, C++ might run like, you know, molasses if you write it in python or if you take a laptop like this it'll run at a certain speed but if you run it on you know some ancient desktop computer from you know 2005 it's not going to run as fast i can go that it's not as ancient but it's 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 getting there um so we need something better to analyze an algorithm than just how long it takes. We can use how long it takes to give us an idea if we do things on the same machine and in the same language to see what kind of efficiency it has. That was what we did in that one assignment. And the solution for figuring out how efficient something is big O notation, and you should know what the O stands for. There's also T notation, and you need to know how it's different from big O notation. Um, I'm just going to say this and without writing it down, it doesn't matter if we've got the Zoom recording. Uh, T notation is the number of steps something takes, and big O notation is approximately on what order of magnitude does something require. Um, you will have a question that has a short code fragment, and you'll definitely need to um, figure out whether it's O or order one, order N, O, whatever. Hmm? Pardon? What is T notation? Um, let me go back to the book here and take a quick look. Under algorithm analysis. Uh, here we go. Good basic unit is might be the number of assignment statements performed. Call it T, where this is the time it takes to solve a problem of size, size N, namely how many steps it takes. Okay. And then we can use the, that. So, for example, if I have something that takes, let's say, N assignments and something else that takes five N assignments, those are still both linear. The five doesn't matter. It's the N that counts. Okay. Or something that's n steps versus n plus 200 steps. Okay, In terms of big O notation, those are still both linear. The 500 that I added on, that constant 500 doesn't matter in the long run. Um, when I say O1, what's a name for that? The order one, but there's a... Yeah. It, well, let me ask you this. Would that be the, what we call linear time or not? 
is order one linear or quadratic or what? Okay, you need to know the name for it. And that happens to be here somewhere in the book, I'm pretty sure. Uh, let's go here, we go notation. Yes, there we go. So order one is constant time. If something is n, order n, it's considered linear uh, um, algorithm. And log n is log linear and so on. Okay. So these have names. That way we don't have to say O n or order of n. We just say, oh, it's linear. That saves us a little bit of, it saves us a few neurons. Um, well, since there's only one data structure that's going to be on the test, we're not going to have Qs and decks on the test, by the way. Um, LIFO, we, we definitely know what it stands for. And there's only one data structure that we've used it with, which is hmm? stacks. Yes. Um, be able to convert an infix expression to a postfix. Yeah. Remember that if I have something like three plus uh, four yeah, times five, that would go to, let's see, um, three, four plus five times. Because the multiplication is the last thing that happens here. Whereas if I had something like three plus four times five, in postfix, that would be four, five times three plus. Because the multiplication comes first. And the book has an algorithm of how to do that manually. And the best way to do it is to fully parenthesize everything and then pull the operators out to the end. Um, where was that? Where would that have been in the book? Uh, some... uh, infix, prefix, and postfix expressions. There we go. So, yeah, here we go. Conversion of infix to prefix and postfix. And they fully parenthesize everything, and then they just pull things out of the parentheses. I, don't, I won't say just. Then they pull things out of parentheses, which sometimes is really easy and sometimes not. Um, know the big O performance of various array list and hash map operations. So if I want to enter a key in a hash map, is that constant, linear, quadratic, or what? If I want to remove something from the array list at um, an arbitrary location in the middle, is that going to be a linear, constant, or what? And then the question is, why do we need these wrapper classes like double and integer? And the main reason is, got the wrong font there. Curse me. Oh, I don't want that one either. Mainly, um, that's your main reason that we need the wrapper classes, and the, also that um, know about boxing. Oh well. That's useful to know. Not, I don't think it's vital for the test, but it's useful. <laughs> so those are the topics that are going to be on the question and answer part. Now, what about the program part? Uh, the program part of this is going to be... Um, a program that modifies a stack. Okay, I can give you that. And you will be provided with the stack.java um, code that you will put in the same directory as your program. You will not uh, 
copy and paste the code into your program. Why? Because I'm going to have my own copy of stack.java and I'm going to use it instead of you having to upload it. But they have to be in the same um, area. Same directory. Now, I'm also going to provide you with, so this is stack.java. I'm going to upload that today, by the way. It's the same thing that we've been using all along. Yeah. Um, stackutil.java, I'm giving you a couple of methods that you can copy and paste into your program, and that may make your job a little bit easier. And this um, file, again, which is going to be provided for you, will have a make stack method. So you give it an array of items, and the first element of the array will be at the bottom of the stack. The last item will be at the top. And it allows you to use generics. Notice I'm using the generic here so that I have a one shot on the fly. I can use generics for this one method, which is what you'll need to do in your program. And also, I don't know if you're going to need a to be able to reverse a stack to do the program, but yeah, it couldn't hurt to provide it for you. So I'm giving you this method as well. And then I wrote this main method just so that I could make sure that everything really works properly. And I wanted to make sure that generics work. So I tried it first with a stack of integers, and then I tried it with a stack of strings. So I know that make stack works properly with integers and make stack works properly with strings. And my reverse method also works. Oh, now I have a big question in my head, and that is whether I should give you an example of a program that modifies a stack. Yeah. Am I giving away too much? Yes, I am. But I'll, I guess I'll, I'll have to do penance, penance for it later. <laughs> okay, so let's do this. Um, let's save this. And let's call this stack example.job. And here's what we're going to do. This um, program um, creates a method named square stack, which takes a stack of integer as its only parameter and is a void method. What it does is rich, or, um, change the stack so that every element is squared, but everything is still in the same order. As it was before. <laughs> That's not even English. Okay. I'm sorry, but this is the kind of thing that I need an editor to I need to edit this later, but you get here, here's what I mean. So if I stack before is let's say 10, 5, um, 7, 12. Then after I call it my stack will have 125, 49, and 144, where this is going to be the top of the stack in both cases. So that's my plan. So this is going to be um, public class stack example. Sort of a terrible name for it, but oh well. Now, what I'm going to definitely need, I'm going to definitely need my stack util. So let me grab these guys here. I'm going to copy and paste the comments as well. Yeah. Stack.java is in the same directory, so I don't have to copy and paste it. And here we have public static void main. Okay, let's think for a second here and let's plan out how this has to happen. So let's say I have here, I, I don't want to do this vertically. I'm going to do it horizontally if you don't mind. 
10, 5, 7, and 12. And there's my top of the stack. Okay. I can only get to things at the top of the stack, correct? So that means that this is my original stack. What I'm going to need is I'm going to need a stack that is going to hold all of my results, yes? So I'm going to have to have something called a squared stack, let's call it. And then I'm going to pull off the top five and seven. And that means 144 is going to be at the bottom of this stack. Now I pull off the seven and that gives me 144 and 49, correct? Then I pull off the five and square it and add it to the squared stack, which gives me 49 and 25. And then I finally pull off the 10 and add that in here, which gives me 49, 25, and 10. Okay, great. Now my original is empty. 100. I forgot to square it. Yeah. Now the question is, how do I get the original? I need this. What I want as my result is 125, 49, 144, correct? Yeah. So the question is, how do I get from point A? I don't know why this thing is trying to go into. So what will get me from point A to point B? I can pop them back and, okay. Okay. So, so. Yeah, I pop everything off of squared stack and push it onto original. And by the way, I just violated one of my own style rules here. Since this is a variable, it has to begin with a lowercase letter. There, I feel much better now. <laughs> but notice I'm, I'm actually planning this out. I'm writing down numbers and seeing, okay, what do I have to actually do here? By the way, do we have anything that will pop everything off of one stack and push it onto the original and hint, hint, reverse order? Why, yes, in fact, we do. We have a method called reverse, which will take an original stack, and as long as it's not empty, it pushes onto the reverse stack, whatever. And it clones the original, by the way, just so that the original never goes away. Okay, now that we know this, great. Okay, so let's create um, an array of integers here. Oh, no, excuse me, an array. A stack of integers. And let's call it int stack, because... Uh, decent name for it, I guess. And that's going to be a new, well, okay, we could make a new stack or we could use make stack. So that's probably a lot easier for us to do. We're going to make a stack and we're going to give it an integer array because remember it needs an array of objects. And let's put in 10, five, seven and 12. Not the same as I used in the example, but the same idea. And now what we need to do is we need to say, um, and then what we want to do is we want to, what do I call the my method here? Square stack of int stack. And then oh, what has to happen here? Public static void um, square stack. Uh, no, 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 wrong. So now what we definitely need is we need a new stack of integer. Um, we'll call it squared items. 
Why? Because I don't want to have the name of a variable being the same as the name of a method. That's really a bad way of doing things. Because also this has only the letter D to, sig to, to distinguish it. Not a good idea. So this I'm going to call them squared items. There we go. And come back in here. That's going to be an empty stack at the beginning. So we need a new stack. Now what we're going to do here is as long as it is not the case that my original is empty, then I'm going to say um, top item becomes original dot pop. I could do this all in one line, but I want to do it in three lines to make it very clear what's going on here. And then what I want to do is I want to say squared items dot push of top item times top item. Now what I'm going to do here for debugging I want to make sure that I have the right thing where I want it. In fact, since this is a void method and I don't have to return anything, I could test this right now. I still haven't done my reversal at the end, but I don't care right now. I just want to check to see that this works. Okay. So I had 10, 5, 7, 12. Great. Yes, it did reverse them. Okay. So now I know that I have confidence that I'm doing the right thing. Then I can set original to become reverse of squared items. And because this is a reference, when I, I it, it's, it's, it should all work like a champ. Well, we're going to find out pretty darn soon here. I have an empty stack. Ooh, that's not good. Wow. Huh. That means that ooh, this is really bizarre. Hmm? No, there's no return because it's a void method. Okay. I just want to see what happens here. So the reversed is great here, all right? The question is, why when I did the after, is my original not reversed, okay? I'm going to have to look at that and think about it, okay? Um, what I might have to do, if I can't figure this out, okay, we're, we're hitting, hitting break time right now. Why don't we take the 10 minute break? And while you're taking the break, I'm going to figure out what the hell is going on here. Okay. This is really bizarre. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, I think I see what's going on here. The problem is I'm using this reverse and it's creating a brand new stack. And this brand new stack gets assigned to original, but remember everything is call by value. And because everything is call by value, okay, well, I'm gonna write down what's happening, what, what went wrong. I, I, I see it now. Okay. The, First time I tried this, um, the square stack method. Um, return thing. Why? Okay. I passed in original. 
and modified it, by the way, inside of Square Stack. When I uh, called reverse, it created a brand new reference and put that into the original inside of Square Stack. I'm I'm writing this down for myself, and it's not a it's an explanation that I'm 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 talking myself through this. You can read it later, and you can ask me later. I can go into more detail on it, but I need to document this. But remember, original is merely a copy of the reference. When I put in a new reference that didn't change the original back in main. Okay. That's where it's there. Copy of the reference for main, changing original, change the int stack reference. Called reverse it created with an original inside of square stack, which did not affect the int stack reference because square stack has only a copy, not an original. This means I can't use reverse. And you were right. The best thing to do is to keep modifying original again. I have to modify original, which is the copy of my main reference variable. Okay, now that I have now that I have figured this out in my head, now I can write it. So I can't use reverse here, unfortunately. So I can't say, well, not squared um, items is empty. I'm going to directly modify original. Push of squared items dot pop. So it looks as if I was I was being too clever. Make stack is safe. Reverse might not be the best idea in the world. There we go. Now it works fine. So here's what I'm going to do. Let me uh, hide this. And I'm going to just keep this here. And I'm not going to upload this. Okay, because otherwise, during your when you're writing your program, you could copy and paste this, but you can look at this in Zoom, or you can take a picture of it, and then you're going to have to analyze it yourself. Okay, philosophical note. This is why we don't like to modify things in place it causes all sorts of weird problems this is why it's probably better to have a method that returns a brand new stack as its value yeah. and again preferably Uh, depending on how, how I feel about philosophy, I might change the program for Wednesday so that it will return a new one rather a new stack rather than having to deal with this deal with this particularly crazy error. Okay. Let me give that some thought. I'll talk to the other professor and see what he thinks. Okay. Um, let me stop sharing here. And let me stop recording.